You turn on the TV, the news presenter is talking about gun violence in the U.S. We're not even a quarter of the way through the year and 8,418 Americans have already died because of a gun. That's around 117 deaths a day. It seems that every time you hear news from the U.S., it's either about politics, war, or gun violence. Non-Americans shake their heads, thinking the U.S. should be called the United States of Murder. Effectively a giant war zone, 2,680 miles across, whose borders should be demarcated with crime scene tape. But is it? Or are the war zones actually concentrated in just a few places? Today we're going to figure this out, and if it's true, attempt to explain why. One thing people never usually hear is that much of the U.S. is relatively quite safe. Many parts of the country aren't that bad at all, in terms of murder and other violent crimes. Even on the whole, the U.S.'s murder rate isn't much different from Turkey, Thailand, and Tunisia, countries you don't immediately think are dangerous in relation to ultra-violence. As you'll soon see today, 2020 was a bad year for murders in the U.S., and we can partly blame that on the stresses of the pandemic. That year, there were 7.8 intentional homicides per 100,000 people in the USA. Over 21,570 people were murdered in total, many with a gun. That was up from 6.52 per 100,000 in 2019, 5.07 per 100,000 in 2018, and 5.01 in 2017. There seems to be some sort of confusion about the numbers for 2021 and 2022, but the FBI estimates are that the murder rate increased yet again in 2021. We don't yet know the numbers for 2022, but it certainly aren't back in the good old days of 2017. Something has changed in America, which you'll hear about in due time. U.S. murder rates are hardly something to be proud of, but they pale in comparison to some other countries in 2020. Jamaica, 44.7, Nigeria, 22, Venezuela, 36.7, Mexico, 28.4, South Africa, 33.5. We know what you're thinking, but the USA is the richest country in the world, so you'd like to expect the murder rates to reflect that. You want the US murder rate to be more like Australia at 0.9, or Canada at 2.0, or England and Wales at 1.2. Aren't those nations supposed to be close to US in cultural terms, in terms of safety? They actually are, but only in some parts of the US. Much of the violence in the U.S. is indeed concentrated in crime hotspots. According to a recently published report, just 2% of American counties accounted for a massive 56% of the country's entire murders. That same report said 54% of U.S. counties had absolutely no murders at all that year. As some researchers explained, there are three types of counties in the U.S. Those that have no murders, those that have just a few, and those which should be constantly wrapped in crime scene tape. They said it's getting worse too, explaining murders in the USA are very concentrated and they're becoming even more so. The US Bureau of Census says that there are 3,006 counties in the US. However, in some states, they're what are called county equivalents, such as parishes or boroughs. They serve the same purpose, which is related to administrative stuff. California is the biggest state in terms of population, with about 39 million people living there. They all live in any of the 58 different counties, with each county being responsible for things like public health or the police force. Los Angeles County, which is the biggest county, with a population of around 10.5 million. Cook County in Illinois is the next biggest, with a population of around 5.3 million. Then comes Harris County in Texas with 4.7 million, and the next two largest are Arizona's Maricopa County, 4.4 million, and San Diego County, 3.3 million. When you hear about murder rates and tough places to live in the U.S., you don't usually think of counties, it's all cities that take the blame. Let's also look at those. According to the World Population Review, St. Louis has the highest murder rate of all U.S. cities at 69.4 per 100,000. Next up is Baltimore at 51.1 per 100,000, then New Orleans at 40.6 per 100,000, and the following cities make up the top 10 of America's murder capitals. Detroit, Michigan, 39.7, Cleveland, Ohio, 33.7, Las Vegas, Nevada, 31.4, Kansas City, Missouri, 31.2, Memphis, Tennessee, 27.1, Newark, New Jersey, 25.6, and Chicago, Illinois with 24 per 100,000. St. Louis is in Missouri, where there are 114 counties. The city itself is independent, but it shares a boundary with St. Louis County. It's the same as with Baltimore. It's independent of Baltimore County, but the county partly surrounds it. New Orleans is in Orleans Parish, same as a county, which is actually quite small, but is one of the leading counties for murder, way more dangerous than the other 63 counties in Louisiana. This is why we're saying that much of the U.S. is relatively safe. The murders are concentrated in certain areas. Then again, as many of our American viewers know, it's not as if every part of the city is the same. Some of you probably know that in St. Louis, a lot of the violence you hear about happens in certain places such as the Gravois Park in the Jeff Vanderloo neighborhoods. You can cross many or even most American cities and be forgiven for thinking you've just crossed two different countries, from highly developed to a veritable poop hole. 
This is evident in Baltimore, where there's almost a 20-year difference in life expectancy within the same city, depending on which neighborhood you live in. According to the city's health department in 2022, if you grew up in North Baltimore or Homeland, you can expect to live to 84. But if you grew up in Clifton Berea, on average, you'll be clocking out at 66.9. For the Greenmount East area, the life expectancy is 67.9, and for Druid Heights, 68.2. A resident of West Baltimore, where in general, life expectancy is on par with quite poor countries such as Bangladesh, Guatemala, and Cambodia, told a news reporter, every time you turn on the TV, somebody's dying every day, all day. Murder is just one reason for this, but another reason is in poor America, people see doctors less than middle class or rich people do. They eat less healthy food. As this paper in the National Institutes of Health stated, people in America who live in the most poverty-dense counties are those most prone to obesity. Counties with poverty rates of 35% or greater have obesity rates of 145% greater than wealthy counties. Before our American viewers start to feel bad about the state of things, just remember that many developed countries have huge life expectancy gaps. In the UK, a country where more and more people now rely on food banks, a 2022 study showed that if boys are born into families with wealth, they can expect to live 18.6 years more than boys born into poverty. For poor and rich girls, the gap is 19.3 years. In the UK and the US, the sad fact is your zip code determines how long you live. It doesn't explain the murder rate, but the fact is where life expectancy is low, the murder rate is usually high. People live on the edge, many don't have safety nets, desperation breeds crime and so-called deaths of despair. Such deaths, which include drug overdoses and alcohol-related liver disease, have been on the rise in the US for years and just got a whole lot worse during the pandemic. Life is cheap, or cheaper, and this seems to lead to more murders. In McDowell County in West Virginia, the average life expectancy is just 67 years. In East Carroll Parish in Louisiana, it's 68 years. And Cameron County in Texas is 70 years. These are all relatively low compared to the US average of 77, but we can't blame that all on murder. There are multiple factors, and those factors relate to poverty. As you already know, it's often certain neighborhoods within these counties that bring the life expectancy rate down. So with Shelby County in Tennessee, population of 937,000 plus, the life expectancy might be 75.5, but like Baltimore, the life expectancy changes between various parts of the county, and where it's lower, there tends to be more violent crime. Crime maps tell us some areas in Shelby County get an A-plus for violent crime, and others get a lowly F. Moving on, here are the top 10 counties in the U.S. with the highest murder rates. Number 1. St. Louis City, Missouri – 69.4 murders per 100,000 population 2. Baltimore City, Maryland – 51.2 3. Wayne County, Michigan – 19.7 4. Jefferson County, Alabama – 18.6 5. Orleans Parish, Louisiana – 18.5 New Orleans City is higher than the parish 6. Shelby County, Tennessee – 16.3 7. Milwaukee County, Wisconsin – 16.2 8. Hines County, Mississippi, 16. 9. Richmond County, Virginia, 15.8. 10. Davidson County, Tennessee, 15.1. But in terms of sheer numbers, Cook County in Illinois comes out on top, and the reason, as our American viewers know, is that it contains Chicago. The most recent data from 2020 said there were 775 murders that year, most happening in a few spots not all over the city. Here's a news report from 2019. Chicago has the largest life expectancy gap in the country. Residents living in the Streeterville community live to be 90, but just 9 miles away in Englewood, residents only live to be 60. Guess where the murders happen? Next up is LA. LA has five counties, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Ventura counties. The vast majority of murders, according to a Crime Prevention Research Center report, said LA County was where most of the blood was shed. In total, in 2020, there were 691 murders. These were the next bad boys on the list in terms of total murders. 3. Harris County, Texas, 537 4. Philadelphia County, 495 5. New York City's five counties, a combined 465 6. Wayne County, Michigan, 379 murders 7. Shelby County, Tennessee, 311 murders 8. Maricopa County, Arizona, 299 murders 9. Baltimore City County, 291 murders 10. Dallas County, 281 murders the crime prevention research paper on homicides in the U.S. concluded this. The worst 1% of counties, the worst 31 counties, have 21% of the population and 42% of the murders. The worst 2% of counties, 62 counties, contain 31% of the population and 56% of the murders. The worst 5% of counties contain 47% of the population and account for 73% of the murders. 
But even within those counties, the murders are very heavily concentrated in small areas. Now we're throwing a lot of data at you here, so to make things easier, there's a map that shows how concentrated murders are in the US. The darker the red, the more murders. No red means no murders. The light reds you see mean a few. Much of the US is like those western nations we mentioned at the start. Just 10% of zip codes in LA County reported 41% of all murders, 20% of zip codes were responsible for 67% of the murders, and the worst 30% of all the zip codes accounted for 82% of all the murders. Basically, two-thirds of LA County is pretty damn safe, and the rest can feel like living through a zombie apocalypse at times of peak craziness, and that's not an exaggeration by the way. From January 2021 to June 22, the 77th Street Division Police reported the most murders. This is in South LA, close to the places you might have heard of because of their relationship with gangs. We'll come back to gangs soon. Just below the 77th Division is the Southeast Division, which has the second highest rate of homicides. The Newton and Hollenbeck Divisions also recorded high rates of murders. All these divisions are pretty much next to each other. As we said, 2020 was a bumper year for American murder. In LA, there was a staggering 37.1% increase in violent crime. People in LA have been arguing about budgeting for the cops. Some folks want larger police budgets and some folks want less. But as we've been showing you in this show, poverty is the most reliable marker for murder. Where there's desperation, there will be crime, even if you outfit your police department with robocops and bring in the tanks. If you want your tree to bloom, take care of the roots, don't hack at it with a chainsaw. Anyway, we looked at the police budgeting over the last 10 years in LA, and while there have been changes in the budget at times, it doesn't seem to have any considerable effect on the rate of violent crime. People need hope and economic opportunities. They don't need cops walking down the streets wearing Special Forces tactical gear as Apache attack helicopters and Predator attack drones swoop down on a house in Compton and a bunch of barely educated kids put heroin and cocaine into baggies to be sold to people who've had traumatic childhoods. We know a lot of people over the last few years have been screaming about defunding the police. But remember that many of the people who have talked seriously about this have said they don't mean get rid of the cops. That would be stupid and dangerous. They know what'll happen if there are no police on the streets. What some are asking for is maybe rather than militarizing the police even more than it is, that money should go instead to things such as community programs, training mental health workers, and even social workers so there might be fewer instances of violence between citizens and with the cops. Others just say the police need to be trained better because, let's face it, being a police officer in some parts of the USA must be one of the most stressful jobs on the planet. Data from the Department of Justice says 15% of US cops experience PTSD symptoms. We also have seen that there have been countless instances where cops showed very little skill at de-escalation in situations that have, at times, led to brutal acts of violence. As you know, in some cases, the police acted in a way that can only be described as savage. Police budgets won't magically fix the problem of crime, though, especially where parts of the US are starting to look like science fiction dystopias, where there used to be industries such as automotive, textiles, and mining, and now there are deaths of despair that just got a lot worse during and after the pandemic. Kensington Avenue in Philadelphia is a good example, but this is just one pocket of sadness in a country where civic failure is getting more pervasive. The crime rates in Kensington are 123% higher than the US average. If you research Kensington Avenue, murder is a word you often see associated with it. Not long ago, a young drug-addicted woman was set on fire in a park not far from a textile mill that was closed down with other places of work during the period of Kenzo deindustrialization that started in the 1960s. There are many areas like this in the US, and many tend to have high murder rates. Shockingly, the researchers who wrote the crime study we've been mentioning say if something doesn't change and these pockets of poverty don't see some light at the end of the bloody tunnel, then in the future, one in every 179 Americans will die as a result of murder. We think this is a huge exaggeration. Still, no one can deny that current US murder rates are appalling for such a rich and advanced nation. For many, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Murder rates have always been really high where there's widespread poverty, but since the pandemic the gap between rich and poor in the US has expanded into a deep chasm reminiscent of diabetic necrosis in an obese person's leg. The fact that it just got wider can't be ignored when we're trying to figure out these extra murders. The pandemic proved to be one of the greatest transfers of wealth in the history of the modern world. While we should always be careful in regard to causation and correlation, we can at least ask if this burgeoning inequality has something to do with the murder rates and certainly the life expectancy plummet in some places. Billionaires in the US saw their wealth increase by 70% during the pandemic. Meanwhile, according to the Poor People's Pandemic Report, not only did people in poor countries die at twice the rate as people in rich countries, but those with no safety nets to save them from falling into economic abyss were made even poorer. 
This, we believe, is a reason why those researchers are saying that murder rates are only getting worse. People are not usually born with a murder gene. Sure, genetic factors come into play with all violent behavior, but the vast majority of killers are not natural born. In such desperate environments, they're more likely to see and take part in violence. People who live in poverty often normalize violence. Some data shows a traumatic childhood can affect the brain in a way that people become prone to overreacting in times of great stress. They may have what's sometimes called an amygdala hijack, when they react to psychological stress in a way that exposes themselves and others to violence. Living with constant stress is not good, especially if you've been traumatized as a kid. It doesn't mean that all the people who grow up in a hardship will turn out to be violent, but there's just more chance of it happening. It doesn't help that in the US there's often easy access to firearms, whether legal or on the black market. A couple of years ago, there were 1,073,743 registered firearms in the US, but a whopping 392,273,257 unregistered firearms. It's an estimate because, let's face it, no one has any idea about the real number of guns out there. Suffice it to say, there are lots, and many are in areas of poverty where they're more likely to be used. Even if laws were changed, would people hand in their guns? We doubt it. The last two years have seen the highest number of gun deaths in the US since the 1990s, and that's after we take the population increase into account. There were 45,222 gun deaths in total in 2020, or 13.6 per 100,000, in all causes, not just homicide. In 1974, there were 16.3 gun deaths per 100,000, and that was a super high year compared to the average. African Americans experienced the highest homicide rise in 2020, up 40% to 26.6 per 100,000 people, nearly 12,000 in total. That was close to 12 times more than the rate among white Americans. Native Americans experienced a 27% increase in gun deaths to 8.1 per 100,000. Hispanics experienced an increase of 26% to 4.5 per 100,000. White Americans saw an increase of 28% to 2.2 per 100,000. Native Americans and white Americans saw the highest rates of other types of gun deaths, which we can't mention because of YouTube's moderation policies. Let's just remind you of something now that you've heard those startling differences in ethnic murder rates. About 8.2% of white Americans live in poverty in the US, compared to 19.5% of African American and 17.1% of Hispanic Americans. The rate for Native Americans is 24.3%. Correlation doesn't prove causation, but it can't be ignored where poverty and murder are concerned. The vast majority of poor folks would never even consider killing someone, but statistically given where they live, they just have more of a chance of becoming a victim of murder. The 30% of Americans who are gun owners are statistically never going to shoot someone. 41% of people who own guns live in rural areas far away from where most of the murders take place, and in those counties where you now know there are few or no murders. Still, the majority of Americans, according to Pew Research, own guns because they're worried about their safety. After that comes hunting, which is why 40% of Americans say they own a gun. 48% of Americans, according to studies, are concerned about their safety and see gun violence as one of the biggest concerns in the country. 8 in 10 African Americans polled are concerned about gun violence, compared to 6 out of 10 Hispanic Americans and 4 out of 10 white Americans. About half of Americans want stricter gun laws. Few people would disagree that there should be strict processes in place to buy a gun. Otherwise, you might just get a 16-year-old finding out that they can buy a gun and get thoughts about getting back at their bullies. Still, as we keep saying, it's the same places that keep seeing high murder rates, year in and year out, and it has little to do with some kid who came off his meds and decided he wanted his five minutes of fame. If you look at FBI data, the agency gives the main reason for murders, but doesn't mention indirect reasons, such as poverty, which as you've heard is a major reason. The agency just says conflicts, people generally just falling out. Also there's robbery and domestic violence. There's also mental illness on the list. But gang violence is huge, as is all drug-related violence. The FBI doesn't properly cover this, probably because it can't be certain when a murder was over drugs. People murder and steal to get drugs. Dealers murder each other over drugs. This is another reason why pockets of poverty are sometimes plagued with violence. The war on drugs itself has created a very, very lucrative underground economy that promises, usually for a short time, to lift uneducated and disenfranchised people out of poverty. Drug use shot up during the pandemic and is still up now. That means more drug-related crime and more drug-related murders. The rise in drug use can't be ignored when we're trying to figure out why these murder pockets exist. The last two or three years have seen increases in people abusing heroin, methamphetamines, cocaine, and the dreaded fentanyl. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration said in 2020 that illicit drug use in the US increased by 13%, hitting a 40-year high, no pun intended. 
The federal budget for drug abuse prevention and control in 1981 was $1 billion. In 2020, it was $34.6 billion, just as drug use hit that high. When you adjust that for inflation, the budget has increased by 1,090%. In 2022, the budget was $41 billion, what CSBC called a historic rise in what's been a $1 trillion-plus war so far. So far, it's been a huge waste of money as it hasn't decreased drug use and has increased the presence of gangs and drug-related murders. Like the prison industrial complex, the war on drugs industrial complex is big business. Millions of Americans work for it, directly or indirectly, which is why it wouldn't be easy to stop. Prohibition just means more gangs. When alcohol was prohibited in the US, the murder rate went through the roof as organized crime fought bloody battles in the streets. Even when arrests are made, they create violent power vacuums. The money is just too good. This is why the drugs keep on flowing. If you take out murders in the US related to gangs and drugs, there would be a significant change in the murder rate. One writer said he believes the rate would go down to something like 1,700 per year. He wrote, remove the gangs and drugs, and the US is one of the safest countries in the world. This is, of course, a wild guess, but drugs are certainly a major reason for many murders. He seems to suggest that removing gangs and drugs is something you could just do, like rounding up people and putting them in gulags or ghettos. Getting tough on crime has never really worked before. Drug use has been increasing in the US for decades and it isn't slowing down. The US might just have to rethink its drug policies to see a change, such as treating drugs as a health crisis, not a criminal problem, as they did in Portugal. This will very likely positively affect the murder rate in those murder zones. We should add that while according to the book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration by Michelle Alexander, drug use is widespread among the poor and middle classes and the rich. Statistics show the people getting arrested are mostly poor, unjustifiable numbers of those people are black. The war on drugs has been called the war on poor and more so on African Americans. There is statistically much more of a chance you live in poverty if you've spent time in a drug-infested prison for taking drugs outside of prison, and this desperation can affect the murder rate. No job, no hope, pick up a gun and start slinging on the corner. One in five incarcerated people in the U.S. are presently locked up for a drug offense. Since recidivism rates in the U.S. are some of the highest on earth, about 44% of criminals released will be back in prison within their first year. Many U.S. politicians want the war on drugs to stop, but not the ones you'll likely see on the winner's podium anytime soon. A number of academics and media have pointed out time and again the war on drugs has caused more harm than good. Its relationship with the murder rate is well known. The 200,000 overdose deaths in 2020 and 2021 would almost definitely have been a different story if many of those people hadn't bought their sometimes fentanyl-contaminated fix in the street from people connected to very violent gangs. Thanks to the National Gang Center, we know there are over 20,000 gangs active in the United States, containing something like 1 million people. Their bread and butter is often drugs. The center said their violent activity is concentrated almost always in neighborhoods with high rates of poverty, mass unemployment, and general social disorganization. It also says that poverty is the main reason for joining a gang. Marcus Aurelius once said, poverty is the mother of crime. The Bureau of Justice Statistics said households with a yearly income of less than $25,000 had the highest rate of violent victimization. 47.7 victimizations per 1,000 households. It was 12.4 victimizations per 1,000 households for households earning more than 75,000. What more can we say? This is one huge reason why there are so many murders in specific areas of the US. Not all poor countries have high murder rates, of course, but in the US where there are many guns, gangs, drugs, and drug addiction, and a feeling of hopelessness for many, it seems to have created a culture of violence in some areas. Poverty is correlated with high murder rates, but the exact causes are more complicated and deeply entrenched in the complexities of American culture. Now, you need to watch KFC murder massacre kidnapping that shocked the FBI, or have a look at what makes someone join a gang.